so much of Jewish liturgy calls upon us to imagine, to use our ability to remember, to bring us to connection. And on Yisker, that's something that happens so naturally. We move to that place of connection with those no longer here. It is a time to name our memories. And as we name them, the conversation that we have with our loved one continues. I want to give you a phrase for today's Yisker. Name the memory. Name the memory. Start by opening up your heart and your mind to the memories of the people you will name in a few moments. And as you name your memories about them, start that conversation that on a certain level they can't respond to, but because of your past and your knowledge, your memories and your stories, you can have a back and forth. As you have those conversations, as you name those stories, as you allow memory to sweep over you, it changes you. Picture your loved ones whispering, whispering into your ear, reminding who they were, what they stood for and what they taught us. It's why this book is so precious. Listen to what Eddie Korngold wrote in the memorial book about her husband, Mort. She wrote his integrity and wisdom guided us all through life. He strongly believed in kindness, social justice, community involvement. His value, sense of humor, broad smile, and love of chocolate is still with us today. And so when Eddie Etter enters into Yisker, she's thinking about how she and her family lives his kindness, how she takes his love of social justice and makes it continue, how his involvement in community, he was a past president who loved this community, will now live through her children. As she pictures his smile, his humor, his values, they continue to live. He continues to whisper, and she can even taste that chocolate that he so loved. Yisker's the chance to let those values of our loved ones sweep into our soul. It lets us recommit to that which we knew they wanted to impart to us. Name the memories. And as you name the memories, you feel the impact. I need to mention that sometimes Yisker brings up unsettling memories. And I would suggest that discussions with those memories actually bring healing as well. Name the memory, even the painful ones. Sometimes the memories are beautifully mundane. There's a poem that we put in this year by Rabbi Harold Schulweis. And here's what Rabbi Schulweis writes about a person remembered at Yisker. Not the wisest, not the smartest, not the kindest, not the most tactful, not the richest, not the most successful, not the tallest, not the bravest, but my own. That's what happens when you name the memories. You know, I think sometimes we think that it has to be something that's so extraordinary and moving. Yisker is also the everyday. It's what the person was not. And it's that sense of 
for all that the person may not have been. They were mine. They were my own. Name the memory. And as you name it, that line, my own, how they were yours, fills your heart. There's something about naming the memory that takes us to emotion. We feel it. We grieve once again. We cry. And those emotions need to come out. In some ways, the tears of Yisker, the sadness of Yisker, the missing of loved ones, we need to name it. It's so real sometimes so difficult. A friend shared with me a podcast by Colin Campbell, who had an unfathomable loss. His children, Ruby, age 17, and Hart, age 14, were killed in an auto accident. He and his wife and their children were traveling, and the car was smashed into by a drunk driver. He wrote a book called Finding Words. And in it, he talked about how you face grief that you can't imagine and how we can help others who've experienced profound loss. And I wanna suggest that as we name the memory, as we feel the emotion, we open our hearts to others who've had similar experience and then teach one another how to best respond. Here's his core advice. It's why I am repeating the line, name the memory. And he says, as we learn to name our memories, we learn to ask people about their memories. Because people usually want to share those stories. Colin urges us to overcome the fear and anxiety that we might say the wrong thing. He asks us to confront that part of us that wants to avoid uncomfortable emotions, the worries that someone may not want to talk about it. And he wisely says, if they don't want to talk about it, they'll tell you. As we name the memory, we're allowed to grieve to hold on and even to let go a bit all at once. Colin loves to talk about Ruby and Hart, how they were sweet, kind, and loving, part of a family that was kind and loving. They just loved to hang out and play games. The family belonged to Ikar, a synagogue in Los Angeles. And amidst the communal pain of this loss, Rabbi Browse, Sharon Browse, two years ago wrote a Kol Nidre sermon that was really a love letter, trying to equip the community to grieve and comfort and face loss. Colin shared that it brought healing. All of those little things that are big things all of those pieces of character that are essence that we hold on to. Rabbi Brown shared that it hearts bar mitzvah. The portion was the one about skin disease. And that heart didn't like the Torah's insistence that the mitzvah, the person afflicted with the disease, had to go out into the community and say, I am unclean, I am unclean, tame, tame. I thought it was cruel, unfair that on top of dealing with illness, the person had to be shamed in front of the whole community. And so Hart struggled with the idea until reading an interpretation that likened the Mitsora back then to a person with anxiety or depression today. This made sense to Hart. Hurt could see how people struggling with mental illness might withdraw from community and that that contributes to the stigma around the illness, 
further distancing people from the help that they desperately need. Hart realized that it's only when a person steps forward and becomes vulnerable, feeling comfortable, if possible, sharing with trusted people, then they can open their hearts to the healing embrace and support that comes as you name it and people hold you with care. Heart taught the healing power of opening up. And Rabbi Brous wondered if Heart might have saved lives that day by helping people not be afraid of talking where pain lives. Name the memory. Naming the memory about heart, let those lessons live. And Colin, her father, her father loves sharing the stories because the lessons then continue. His daughter Ruby loved the ocean. Colin shares in his book that Ruby actually wrote about being in the ocean, the mix of anticipation and danger when an approaching wave was coming. When the waves were rough before long, a wall of water rumbled towards her and Ruby would take a deep breath, dive to the ocean floor, waiting for the wave to pass. And sometimes it passed quickly and she reemerged unharmed, but sometimes the force was so great she tumbled and turned in the darkness, unable to tell which way was up. Unsure for a moment, she finally resurfaced, gasping for air, scanning the sea for the next wave. Ruby knew the ocean. She knew that the only way to survive the next wave is to swim forward to meet it. She wrote about the ocean, but her father, Colin, said she was really writing about the struggle of living and learning to overcome anxiety and OCD from which she suffered. That may have been the inspiration for Colin, for Hart's sermon. As her father, Colin, names memories of his beloved children, their wisdom becomes his wisdom. That wisdom spreads to all of us, and we live differently. That's why this book is so powerful. Their wisdom becomes our wisdom, and we live differently. I want you to take a moment to think about the stories, the lessons, the lives of your loved ones. I want you to create space to name the memories, feel the emotions, What is the emotion that comes up? It's not always the emotion of sadness. Sometimes it's joy and laughter. Colin wrote in his book about the emotion of fear. How initially he was afraid to walk into his home knowing he would be without his children. He was afraid to sit down at the dinner table without them. The void was so powerful. And as he named his grief, he shares in his book that he began to emerge from it. And he says, so can we. He writes, you just need to talk about it. We need to share our pain. We needed to talk about our loved ones. He says, not everyone is going to need to talk. Some people are going to need silence. Some will need a break. Some indeed will not be able to talk. As we're aware of the needs of the person who has had a loss, we become those who are present, listening with heart to the way they need to be listened to. Colin shared that the doctor who shared the, the brutal news about his children said to them, tell me about Ruby and Hart. And so she sat with them in this most extreme moment, not afraid of the pain. They wept together and kept talking. Colin calls it running toward the pain so you can ultimately let go of it. And he writes beautifully about how Jewish rituals of burial and saying Kaddish were another way of running to the pain amidst the support and love 
of everyone who surrounded them. For all that each of us grieve differently, we do so surrounded by people who care. That for me is the power of Yisker. It's the power of saying Kaddish in a minion, a community of people who have suffered loss as well. Say to one another, Hineni, I'm here for you. Hineni, you're not alone. Hineni, let me listen to what you want to share. We can't take pain away, but we will be here to love you, to listen. This is Yisker.